Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Eichraff, Director and Leon Levy, Professor here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, welcome to what we call uh, kind of a, an experiment. It's, as you know, this is uh, the Friday of uh, our semi-annual board meeting. And again, it's great pleasure to, uh, to uh, uh, welcome our uh, members of the Board of Trustees to this, to this lecture. Uh, but I think what we're trying out tonight is something slightly different. We organized a mini symposium. In fact, that sounds already kind of grand. It's only one hour, so it's perhaps more a micro symposium, <laughs> a nano symposium. You could <laughs> uh, uh, the organizer of tonight's uh, about the, uh, the uh, role of the abstract mathematics of topology in the real world. And tonight's organizer, and I really want to compliment him for being so uh, adventurous to be leading this experiment, is uh, Robert McPherson, the Hermann Weil Professor in the School of Mathematics. And joining him are two former members, Raoul Rabadan, Associate uh, Professor in the Department of Systems Biology at Columbia University, and Randall Kamian, Professor of uh, Physics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Bob McPherson, as you know, he has been a faculty member since 1994, and he is really one of the leading minds in understanding geometry, topology, in a wide range of activities. Um, in fact, many of us know his work as very, the very deep, difficult also, mathematical work. But he has a very wide interest in the applications of topology. And um, I think he has been kind of entertaining this thought that topology has examples far, far beyond uh, math pure mathematics to uh, areas as biology or, or mechanics. And a decade ago, he started a program, uh, well, in fact, he himself started to attend graduate courses, I think, in the uh, engineering department of Princeton University uh, with the idea that problems involving materials material science could benefit from topological thinking. I guess your thought is that we could all benefit from topological <laughs> thinking. And then in 19, uh, 2007, uh, together with David Sholovitz, then the chair of the Princeton University Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, the two of them used topology to, to discover a three-dimensional higher solution to an open problem that existed since 1952 when John von Neumann, a professor in the School of Mathematics at that time, solved it in two dimensions. And in 2009, in spring of 2009, Bob, together with Konstantin Mikhaikov from Rutgers University, started organizing a series of seminars to discuss these interface between topological methods, both theoretical and computational, and understanding a broad range of phenomena in the natural world. Um, these seminars on the title Workshops on Topology, Identifying Order in Complex Systems, continue today and are now organized with one of the other speakers, Randy Kamian, uh, at this, as we speak. Now, Raoul Rabadan, uh, our other presenter tonight, he arrived at the Institute in October 2003 as a member in uh, theoretical physics uh, after spending two years in CERN. Um, and he uh, had, I think, really life-changing uh, uh, experience here because he transitioned basically to a biologist, attending the lectures by Professor Arnie Levine and becoming fascinating with viruses. He's now, as I said, an associate professor in the Department of Systems Biology at Columbia, and uh, he's collaborating on a wide range of phenomena. Um, he, he now leads an interdisciplinary team that develops and implements mathematical computational tools to extract biological and clinical information from large data sets. And we think of you as the uh, living proof of the success of our, uh, of our biology program here. Now, uh, Randy Kimian uh, was in the academic year 2009-2010, one of the two material scientists that were invited as members to the School of Social Science. Currently, he's the Vicky and William Abrams professor in the Natural Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania, and he leads a research group focused on problems in condensed matter theory, which is currently exploring problems in liquid crystals, soft assembly, and biological physics. And you know, I think you have a kind of a wonderful lineup, and I think all of us can now experience, I think, in one year, or oh, sorry, in one hour, that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Bob and his team has been kind of hosting here at the Institute, and I'm particularly happy with this kind of format, which I think will end with, a, a, I hope, a group discussion, and you can also be involved, because I think it really is reflecting kind of the unique collaborative nature of what happens at the Institute. 
Uh, but of course, we have to start with a proper introduction. And you might also wonder, what is this strange apparatus standing there? <laughs> and I think the Institute archive still cont contained an overhead projector. It's not a magician's trick, although it looks like that. And uh, so um, I hope you uh, uh, join me in welcoming the three speakers to this nano symposium. Thank you very much. So my job here is to, uh, um, to give a pure mathematical description of what topology is, our, 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 um, our subject of the day. Well, um, topology is unique in many ways. One is it's uh, not very old. Uh, mathematics in general is incredibly old. In each case, I've uh, put the, the, the oldest date I know of, which uh, they did mathematics of, of that type um, in a way that we still consider very interesting today. And um, topology is the only one of these which is not essentially ancient. It was, it was co completely uh, uh, missed by the uh, ancients. It was, uh, it was discovered by Riemann uh, uh, essentially in uh, 1860. Uh, we know this because uh, we found uh, papers lying on Riemann's desk after he died, which, which described what, what was um, uh, described to me quite a bit of topology. So what, what I'm going to do today uh, as a way of um, introducing you to topology is tell you what was in those, uh, those papers that were found on Riemann's desk. But first of all, a little bit more about the theory. Uh, the big idea is, is homology or Betty numbers, uh, an, an incredibly powerful idea which I'll describe. Uh, so far as I'm concerned, they're the same thing. So Riemann discovered it. He, he then talked to Betty, who wrote the first paper, and that's why they're called uh, uh, Betty numbers. He wrote the first paper after Riemann died. Um, then, uh, then, then Poincaré wrote a sort of an amazing paper. And then this young guy in Princeton, New Jersey, read Poincaré's paper. And uh, I mean, topology was a mess at the time. It wasn't precise and it wasn't well known, but he somehow got the idea uh, to devote his life and his career to, to, to topology. And so um, he, he, he did many things, but uh, he, he created the, he hired, uh, faculty at Princeton and, and, and at the Institute for Advanced Study. He had visitors come to the Institute for Advanced Study. If you, um, if you look at the, at the hundred years, at the, at the time before this, it was extremely spread out and extremely slow moving. Fifty years passed between the discovery and the time that Veblen got on the case. And then uh, if you look at what happened after that, it was extremely fast. And the United States has, of course, played a central role. So I think we all, I, I just don't know how Veblen understood that, uh, that topology would in the future be such an important thing. Uh, but just in case you think it's an accident, there are two other things he, un he understood. One was the Institute for Advanced Study should be located in Princeton and not Newark. And the second was uh, that the ENIAC computer in Philadelphia should be sponsored by the, uh, by, by the Department of Defense. That was the first American computer. Before, uh, the, the father of the von Neumann computer. Okay, well, uh, geometry is measurement of various sorts. I, I'm assuming you know what geometry is. Uh, uh, topology is geometry without the word metry in it. It's uh, topology without measurement. You, you usually say, uh, we, I usually say qualitative as opposed to quantitative, but that um, usually doesn't mean very much to people. So let me give an example. Um, I chose this example because one of the very first things in Euclid is he constructs the midpoint of a line segment. Uh, so what does it mean to be the, the midpoint of a straight line segment? It means that if you measure the left-hand side with a ruler or measure the right-hand side, you get the same number, in this case, three in, in, um, in, in both cases. Well, in topology, we don't allow um, um, measurement. 
So uh, here's the topological analog of that. I, I'm approximating it by a piece of string. This can't be done on that machine, this antique. <laughs> the, so, so in topology, uh, you know, if, if we deform the thing, it's still the same. We, we don't care. And um, if we also don't know about the midpoint because we can, we can imagine deforming this, this point like that. Okay. Wait. So, so topology can, uh, talks about spaces. Uh, so, so this uh, piece of string is, 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 is my example of a space. Oh, I have to not stand in front of me. Um, and two spaces are, are considered identical if, if we can uh, deform one into the other. So um, that's what I'm doing. All of these spaces are identical. Or, or if I move this down, that, um, uh, all of those things are identical. So the, uh, the goal is, is, to, is to classify topological spaces. Um, and we'll begin with uh, one-dimensional topological spaces. Um, these are confusingly called graphs. Confusingly because to most people a graph is something with an x and a y axis, but anyhow, to, to us they're one-dimensional top, uh, uh, topological spaces. Now Riemann's idea is the simplest spaces are trees. They have a trunk and they always keep branching out. Um, it, it would be fun to explain why trees are so simple. They're interesting things in computer science and so on, but in any case, they're, 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 they're somehow simple, uh, simple topologically. This thing on the right-hand side, uh, however, left-hand side, sorry, is uh, not a tree because, um, right hand, yeah. <laughs> Because if you consider this the trunk, uh, it branches out, but then two of the branches come together. Okay, so Riemann's idea is, is trees are simple, other things are not simple because they have loops in them like this, and so he wants to quantify the degree to which they're not simple. So um, he, his, his, his definition is he takes a first homology tool and he defines the first Betty number as the number of scissors cuts it takes to uh, make the space into a tree. Okay, so let's try it. Here I have something that's not, not a tree. Um, I'm going to insert my scissors, make a cut, and now I have a tree. You can consider this the trunk, that branches out, that branches out, and that branches out. Okay, it had one loop. It took one cut to make it into a tree. The first Betty number is one. Let's try it on a different um, example. Um, here's something that apparently has two loops. There's this one and there's this one. So uh, now, according to Riemann, let's make a cut. All right. Now I have something that has one loop. So let's make another cut. Now I have something that's a tree. I can put the trunk down here and have it branch out as it, is, as it goes up to the top. So that, that's, um, that's the amazing idea that Riemann had that, that is in these, uh, um, in these, these papers. Uh, what he showed is uh, that any procedure I take to cut this thing, I'm going to get the same answer um, independent of how I do it, provided that I never cut it into two pieces. You see, if I took a tree, and I, I can always take a tree and make another cut in it, but it, uh, it's a theorem that any way I make another cut in a tree, it will, I'll, I'll then end up with two trees. So Riemann's hypothesis is that I never divide it into two pieces, and the conclusion is that, that the uh, first Betty number as defined this way is independent. Now, this may seem sort of easy um, because uh, if, if the graph is embedded in the plane, most people with their eye can just pick out the number of loops, and so, so why do we need Riemann to tell us? 
Okay, so here's a graph that can't be embedded into a plane. You see here, this line is passing, it, it has five of these um, uh, vertices, and here this line is passing over those other two lines. Um, here I've made of one of string. You can see this way that it's not, at, at, at this point, it's not glued. Okay, so I leave it to you as an exercise to uh, figure out how many loops this has and uh, i.e. how many cuts it would take to uh, transform it into a tree. Um, and then when we're all done, I'll leave my uh, first Betty, first Riemann homology tool up here and you can come and see if you got the, uh, uh, the right number of cuts. Okay. Now, uh, you're not only interested in one-dimensional spaces, you're interested in higher dimensional spaces. So the analog of the tree in this, in the case of surfaces, is, is a disk. Riemann's program is to whack away at whatever space you have with, with your tools uh, in, in order to reduce it to a disk and then count the number of whacks it took you. But now, in two dimensions, you need a second cutting tool. You can't do it with scissors alone. So Riemann's second cutting tool is a drill, which drills holes in the space. So, um, all right, let's consider um, a sphere, something Riemann knew well. Um, take the surface of a globe. Suppose that, the, now I don't mean this globe to be solid, I mean uh, it to be a surface. Actually, most globes are made of just a surface. They're, they only have air inside. And now, uh, suppose we take Riemann's uh, uh, drill and drill a hole in the south pole of this. If we drill a hole in the south pole, we can spread it out onto a disk like this. This is, a, this is a very famous picture. We have to do a lot of distortion. For example, Canada has become really small and Siberia has become really small. Antarctica has become enormous. This whole thing is Antarctica because I had to reach my hands into that hole which was in the South Pole in the middle of Antarctica and pull it out until it was spread around the whole thing. However, topology it allows you to deform things and extreme deformation like this is perfectly all right. So in this case, uh, it took one cut with a second homology tool, the drill, zero cuts, I didn't, never had to use the scissors, and therefore the, since we had, whoops, since, wait, since we had w one cut with a second homology tool, uh, its second homology, its second Betty number is one, since we had zero cuts with the first homology tool, its uh, first Betty number is zero. Okay. Uh, one last example, consider the, the uh, torus, the surface of a donut, one of, uh, one of topologists' uh, favorite spaces. So um, in this case, uh, it takes one cut uh, with the drill, I can drill a hole and get started. But now, no matter how, how much I tug at it, if I don't tear anything, I'm not going to be able to flatten it down into a disk. In order to flatten it down into a disk, I need um, two other cuts with a scissors. One of them goes around this way, and the other one goes around this way, disappears in behind. So if I, um, I tried to think of a model I could do this with, but, but nothing's, um, flexible enough. Anyhow, if I took, took a very flexible surface and, and drilled a hole in it and then made these two scissors cuts, I would be able to flatten the surface down, down into a disk. Well, um, uh, so since it required uh, one cut with the second homology tool, its second Betty number is one. Two cuts with the first homology tool, its first Betty number is two. So th this, is, uh, this is the result that Riemann gets. Well, um, Riemann generalized this to n dimensions, um, and, and this we know only from, uh, from this, uh, these notes found on his desk. Uh, if we have an n-dimensional space, 
it will require n tools, just like a two-dimensional space required two tools, n different tools. Uh, and Riemann sh sh showed that under certain conditions, the uh, number of times you would use those tools is independent of the order the cuts are chosen or how you cho uh, choose, choose to make them. So in, in, in my opinion, this was undoubtedly the birth time of topology. We don't know exactly when, some time between 1860 and 1866. Through most of its history, um, uh, topology has not been applied. Uh, topologists have almost taken pride in not applying what they do. Uh, one can ask why. Here are two possible things. Some people consider to uh, topology very abstract. Even mathematicians often consider topology very abstract. And some people say, well, it, it can't, there can't be science there because it's, uh, um, it's, science is quantitative and topology is quali uh, uh, qualitative. But um, anyhow, as, as you already heard, we have created this, uh, this series of workshops um, and we're, we're, we're exploring um, uh, applications. One of the things that these workshops have in common is the speakers are almost always from different fields as they are today. Um, my personal hope is that not only will this uh, give us new science, but it will give us new mathematics. In fact, this is already happening. Uh, the, the, these, tech, these problems from outside of um, topology require us to, to develop new ideas and new tools in the subject. Thank you. This is the first uh, uh, part of my story. It was uh, Linné, the guy that you see here, who published a book in 1735, uh, who uh, trying to classify all possible living organisms that were on, on Earth. So he took all the possible animals and all the possible birds and all the possible plants around. And then he devised a system. It was a very interesting system where he took organisms that were closely related and put it in a box. So it was the first taxa, the species. And then boxes that were kind of related to each other, they put it in a different box, a bigger box. It was the genus. And then in such a way that each of the boxes can be only be in one of the top uh, classes. So then going up and up till going to the top, there was the kingdoms. So this is the, the kingdoms. So this is, for example, the, the example of the kingdom of the animals. So he divided the, the kingdom into th six different classes. And then all the animals were classified in uh, this quadrupedia that then it turned to be mammals, birds, and so on. And he was able with this system to systematize basically all the living animals that were around that he knew, except for a few ones. So for example, there were these paradoxa that was here. If you just look here in this publication, there was a paradoxa, animalia. So they were animals that they were not classifiable in his system. So for example, the first one was mentioned is the dragon, for example. So if you have the dragon, you see that it's kind of a reptile here, but they have wings, so you don't know exactly where to put it in, in the system because it belongs to different boxes. The other one, they were saying, I mean, he considered that this was a, a mythical animal, like this one, for example, the pelican was another one of the animals that he considered to be mythical. So then, um, there was a classification system that was taken very seriously by Darwin, and in 1859, uh, he published his book on the origin of the species, where he's, uh, he proposed that this classification reflects something about history. So that was how, I mean, it's not just classifying boxes and things, boxes in boxes. It was basically reflecting how different organisms are related. And they are related because they have common ancestors, something that happened in the past. And he proposed a model of, of how evolution that we understand today. So that was, uh, time is running here. This is the only representation that is the only picture, the only figure that is on the origin of the species in the book. Time is running from the bottom to the top here, and there are different species here, different individuals. They have many different children, off, uh, offsprings. They differentiate. Many of them died, so natural selection is acting here, and they start to diversify up to a point where they, div they become different species. So this is how we understand today how species are, are created. And then um, they became a classification. So this is published, it was published like seven years later, basically the tree of life. It was one of the first representations. So there were the plants here, the kingdoms, and here Protista, that was all the animals that were in the microscope. So, um, so they, uh, all, the, all the different species, they were compared basically looking at similarities. Similarities of how many legs, how many wings, how many flowers or things like that. But then it became a serious science in, in 1970, so 120 years later. 
where people start sequencing and starting getting information about genetic information of, of different organisms. So in 1977, this uh, person, uh, Carl Hughes, using some piece of information, some particular gene that is universal to all the cells that we know, constructed the tree of life based on this information. And he realized something very interesting that was controversial at the time, but now is accepted by everyone, that we're three domains. So now our kingdoms, they are reduced to here. So we are kind of a small part here. The animals are here, but they are domains. So they are different. So there was the bacteria, there was the archaea that was different from the bacteria in many different aspects. And then there were the eukaryotes. And then since the 1990s, uh, there is a true revolution in genomic sequencing. So in, 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 my, in my lab, I work with a lot of genomic information from many different sources. And then uh, we try to put together structures that can represent what is the relationship between different organisms and different things. So I'm going to start mentioning something about why this way of tree thinking um, present problems. So th these problems, they were already realized even by Darwin. There was a chapter in his book that he was realizing that some of the plants, they were they were kind of hybrids. But then, here I'm putting the three big domains of life, and also the viruses. So viruses, they are the most common biological entity that are on Earth. I mean, they're like 10 to the 31 viruses, and they're much more common than all the other three together. So, and much more diverse, by the way. So they are not put in the tree of life for a simple reason, because to put it in the tree of life, you need something to compare with the rest of the things. And viruses, they don't have, for example, this gene. So you cannot put it here, there is no way of of comparing, so there is no way of constructing a tree where you're looking with viruses. I mean, you can do it, but only with some particular subspecies of viruses or subgroups of viruses. So, but people realized um, that there were many exceptions in this philosophy of the box classification. So the idea of the box classification is you have a box and you are in your box, so you are an animal, and you cannot mix the information with someone that is outside the box. So because if you can do that, then you can start doing creating some uh, inconsistencies, like the dragon that we saw. I mean, it was a thing. So um, there are many examples in eukaryotes where people realized that uh, many of the species that we know, they are hybrids, they are combinations of different species. That happens very often in, in plants. Many of the plants that you drink or smoke every day, they are in this classification. So they are kind of hybrids. They are combinations of different plants, of different uh, species. In bacteria, this is something that is very known. So very known and it's something that is a very important problem in hospitals, for example. And different species of bacteria and they exchange genomic material. So they can borrow genomic material from something that is very, very distant in the genomic scale. So this is doing something like, for example, there is a patient that is receiving antibiotics and some genes arrive from another bacteria that you don't know many, most of the times where it's coming from. And then it's creating something that is resistant to this particular antibiotic. Um, we know that in the origins of eukaryotes, probably there was a big uh, not only just borrowing some particular genes, but there was a big collision probably of genomes. So um, there were mitochondria and chloroplast, their uh, organelles that we have, that they were born as some bions, so they are com combined with some uh, combination of some particular uh, bacteria with some particular uh, another cell, and then it became something that we are, the eukaryotes. So all of us, we are the product of one of these some bions. Um, archaea, that there's this three domain that was uh, discovered by Woos, when now we are doing tons of sequencing of different species, and we see that there is a lot of exchange with bacteria that are in different things. So these are domains. I mean, they're exchanged not between different related species, but very far away. And then um, something that was also here at the Institute, so Arn Arne Levine and colleagues, they were looking at something that is very interesting. So in our genome, as you probably know, only 1.5% of our genome is coding, is coding for proteins. All the rest, it's a lot of things that we don't know what is the function in many cases. And there is a huge part of that, like 10% that they are viruses that were at some point came infecting us and they're kind of semi-dead. So we are carrying this cemetery of viruses with us in all of our cells. We are carrying all these things. And then we can do archaeology with these things. And this is what this guy, the guys here at the Institute they did. They identified some viruses that were integrated like 40 million years ago in our genome. It's very interesting. There are many things with phages, viruses infecting bacteria. This happened the whole time. So there's a lot of exchange and so on. So, um, I mean, it looks like these boxes, they are not independent boxes, but they are kind of connected. There is a lot of borrowing, taking genes from one place and taking to another gene, and this happened everywhere. So, uh, this was a paper published by Doolittle in, in 1999. He was saying that this is the tree of life that everyone thought to happen in, in, 
in the beginning of the 90s. So there were the different kingdoms, the domains, the kingdoms. So here are the animals, here we are. And there are two violations of the tree that they were the mitochondria and the chloroplast. So these fusions that happened in the very origin of the eukaryotes. But uh, at the end of the 90s, where all the genomic information came and we started to get all these maps, the tree looked more like that, <laughs> okay? So, um, so then it's a, very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting problem. Now we have tons of information. There are hundreds of thousands of, of genomes, especially in many different species. And then the problem is now how to assemble something like that. And what do we mean by something like that? I mean, it's, it's unclear what do we mean. So, um, so it's a tree, it's a not a good representation of how the different relationships happen to be between organisms. What is it? And just following with our, uh, uh, with Bob uh, talk, is can topology help us to identify some of these things? So I'm going to present some ideas of things that we've been working on other people. And you can, uh, let me just go into uh, an extension of what Bob was saying before to this idea of homology. So uh, persistent homology. So homology, as Bob was saying, is counting loops in these spaces using scissors and drills and all these things. What we have in real life, we don't have a continuous spaces. We don't have a continuous string. When we are working with genomes or data, we have a lot of points. So they can look like continuous, but there's a lot of points, okay? So the idea is that how from this collection of points, we can read something about the structure of the space that is there, okay? So this is a tool that uh, it has been developed in the last 10, 15 years to identify topological features from large collection of data. So imagine that you want to learn the space here, but what you have is not, you don't have the, the blue thing, you have a set of points here, okay? So do you know that there is a loop here? So how do you read from here that there is a loop? Well, one of the things that you can do is instead of considering independent points, you just inflate the points, you make balls around that, and then you, from there, you can construct a graph or an extension of, of, a, of a graph, a complex, and then you can count here the number of loops and other structures that happened here. Okay, so it's a very simple structure. And here there is a representation of how you do that. Imagine that you, this is your data, so you have all these points here. It's a very simple representation. So if you start with a scale that is very small, so you don't inflate the points, you have these things, and what you have is just a set of points. There is no more than that. Then you start making the points bigger and bigger, and they start to get connected. There is a point, so here I just make it bigger, bigger the points, bigger the points, there is a point, and there is a moment where these guys, they start to be connected, and you create a loop. The loop start to get filled in with more connections, and there's a point that the loop is completely filled in. So a way of representing these things, and this is the, the way that I'm going to show the data, is that you have the filtration scale. This is the scale of how big is your ball. And then uh, when you start with something that is very small, all the points are independent, no loops happening. So let's look at dimension one. So this is the number of loops. You start increasing the scale, and there is a small loop that appears. This is a small loop that appears, okay? Continue growing the scale, this guy fill up, so the class die. So you continue, and there is another big loop that is born here. So continue for some scale, and at some point, it's completely filled in by these things, okay? So this is a representation of kind of the topology of your data that is by a set of bars. Sometimes it's called the barcode, okay? So this is the barcode of your data. The idea is that if the data has loops, what you find, you have these barcodes. If you have loops that are consistent at different scales, you have big. Okay, so here is the idea. The idea is very simple, just following with uh, what Bob was saying. So imagine now that we have a lot of information about different species, different organisms, but we have genomes. So instead of talking about, uh, about genomes, I'm going to talk about points. Usually these points are in a very high dimensional space. Now I'm going to start connecting the, the, the points, and if the structure that is behind these points is a tree, what you can see is that there are no loops in the whole thing. So there are no loops that will appear. If, if you happen to have this kind of exchange of genomic material, so for example, if you are a combination of genomic material of your parents, and then you generate something like that, then the loops start to close. So the, the, the trees start to close. And you generate things like that, something in the middle, you start generating loops. So then looking in your data, and you start looking for loops, you start looking for this type of exchange of genomic material, so the evolution that is not tree-like, okay? So I'm going to start with my favorite viral species, not my favorite species that I'm going to mention later. And it's this guy, is flu, that probably, uh, you know, is a very important pathogen in humans. It's a virus, it's an RNA virus, and it's composed, it's something that is very interesting, it's composed by eight different chromosomes that in these viruses are called segments. 
there is called, they are the names of the proteins that they are coding, PB2, PB1, et cetera. Here there is a picture by one collaborator of mine where they took a cell, basically they cut it, and they took some pictures. And one of the things that is very interesting is that you see the structure of the different chromosomes. There is one in the middle and seven around. So, uh, by the way, this is a problem, this is still open. So nobody knows exactly how this structure of eight different chromosomes is put into the, into the structure. Then it presents two ways of evolution that is very interesting. The first way is asexual. So these viruses, and they start mutate, start mutating, and then there is a point that they go infecting a person, mutations, infecting another person, and like that. So the cause of that, they mutate very fast, and one of the implications of that is that these viruses you see in one point in your life, you became immune to these viruses, but then a few years later you get infected again with one of the descendants, and then you get sick again. So every year, WHO has to meet twice to decide what is the vaccine because these viruses, they are mutating and changing. But one of the things that is more interesting even about the virus is that it has another way of evolution. That this is not just a tree-like evolution. It's not making point mutations and moving around. It's doing big jumps in evolution. And this is called reassignment. I'm going to, to give you an example. This is from the book of Arne Levine here. And then it's a cartoon, obviously. And you see that there is this guy who is infected with this virus with eight different chromosomes, eight different segments. And there is a bird that has eight different segments. And with these two viruses going infect this friend of uh, these guys here, it produces a new virus where different segments are coming from different sources. And this virus, for example, is a virus that is very interesting where segment four and six, they are coming from something that the humans never seen before. So this is a very interesting virus. This is what caused the pandemics. This is what happened in 2009, for example. Viruses from different sources, they mix the genomic material and they created something. This is what is happening, if you saw the New York Times, for example, today, this is what is happening now in the Midwest in, with the H5N2. So what you have is that if you have a segment, if you have a particular gene, you get a tree, you have a different gene, you have a different tree, and you have a different gene, and you have something like that. So what happens if we just take thousands of these genomes and then we try to see what is the topology of this structure? It's very interesting. So these are the barcodes here, as I was saying. So you start generating tons of loops, okay? Tons, tons of loops. There are loops that are very small and there are loops that are very long and they persist for a very long time. The interesting things, and this is the thing why uh, biologically it's, it's interesting, is that you can start doing statistics. You can start counting the size of the loops and you can start counting things about what are the different biological processes and what's happening. So here, for example, I just coloring. If you do the distribution of the loops, there are small loops and big loops, and they reflect two different types of exchange of genomic material. So you can exchange genomic material with someone that is very close to you, and then you generate a very small loop. Or you can take someone that is very long away, and then just change, and then you generate big loops. And you can try to evaluate these things, and then you can start doing a statistics, trying to see who, what segment is exchanged with what segment, and then trying to learn something about what is the biology that's happening there. The second example that I'm going to mention is another, my favorite species, human, uh, humans. In humans, we are the combination of the genomic information from our parents. And then there's these processes of homologous recombination where we just combine information and then we pass it along. So we can apply the same thing, and this is done with uh, uh, Pablo Camera here at the, at the Institute also. And then, um, and these are different populations. We took a thousand genomes from different populations around the world. So they are Chinese, from Finland, from Great Britain, from Italy. And then these are fine resolution maps. So basically what you do is applying counting loops in different regions of the, of the human genome and trying to see how these loops appear. And then you have these maps of resolution. This is basically the Betty numbers. So this is the number of loops that you have, 30 loops here in this region, 30 loops in this region. One of the things that you realize that is very, very interesting is that the pattern of recombination is not random. This is a region that is in the small part with chromosome one. So we have uh, all the information, but just to show here, this is a small part here of chromosome one, and you can see all this fine resolution. So the, the recombination happens in hotspots. It doesn't happen randomly across the chromosome, but it happens in some particular regions. So um, we've been applying to many different species, uh, some bacteria and also some finches, some birds from the Galapagos. Again, This is the data, it's public, and so if you want to go here and play with the data yourself, you have thousands of genomes and you can start doing counting loops and doing statistics and doing things like that. And again, some of the software also by Pablo here has been doing. So one of the things that we are trying to do is trying to do a dictionary, okay? It's a dictionary that is not trivial, especially from the biological side. Um, the idea is that to translate concepts in, in topology, some of the things that Bob was mentioning, 
to our language in evolution and how we can read things from, uh, from topology and evolution and the other way around. So, for example, if we don't have, um, if we don't have loops, what we have is that we can, have, we can show that there is a tree in some cases. And then the number of loops is related to the number of exchange of genomic material. Just uh, summarizing. So we can imagine that evolution is happening in a very high dimensional space where sometimes the structure is like a tree, but in most of the cases that we know, there is a lot of exchange of genomic information that makes the structure that is not tree-like. So um, topology can help us with some of these things. We can try to identify some of the loops, the scale of the loops. And one of the things what I'm interested in, in doing is trying to characterize what is the type of genomic information, what is the biological processes that are driving this exchange of genomic material, keeping, uh, keeping uh, a look at the scale so if there are small loops and big loops, they reflect different evolutionary processes that are important. And doing statistics, okay? So basically, this is the work of several people. People here at the Institute, Arnold Levine, with uh, collaborators, mathematicians at Stanford, Leonard Carlson, Andrew Blumberg, and some people in my, in my group, Daniel, Pablo, and a couple other people. Thank you. All right, so Liquid crystals, you know, um, so first of all, people who don't attend mini symposia or even maxi symposia, you know, it's about now the third talk in where liquid crystals really become important in your life, right? Now is the time when you can open your computer or check your email or do any of those things. So I just thought I would preempt you and show you pictures of liquid crystals. These are liquid crystals. They're exactly the font. In fact, <coughs> uh, uh, this one, I can't, uh, is this on? Oh, there you go. This one here and this one here, these are exactly the liquid crystals you have in your displays. The same materials, but they look totally different, right? This is not good for a display, at least not yet. And so, why am I interested in these and what does this have to do with topology? These are incredibly complicated pictures. They're only in two dimensions, I don't have to go into higher dimensions. But what I want to tell you about is how we can analyze these complex pictures using topology, all right? And you have to appreciate that being able to control these things is the basis of the $100 billion year industry that makes displays possible, okay? So here's a picture. This is a standard picture of liquid crystals. Often uh, textbooks have pictures of these. If you Google liquid crystal, this might be the first picture you get. And you look at it, you say, huh, I mean, it's colorful. This is taken with a regular old microscope. So maybe this whole thing is, let's see, a micron. It's about 1,000 a thousandth, no, a millionth of a meter across, or maybe it's a thousandth of a meter, there's many microns in here, and you see these black lines, and you wonder, what are these black lines? By the way, this is called a Schlieren texture, which, if I'm correct in German, just means a uh, schmear, or a uh, or streak, is that right? It just means streak, it's just a streak, this is what people see, and you look at it for a while, you see the cool black stripes, and you notice that sometimes those black stripes come together four at a time. Four. You see, Bob said maybe <coughs> topology is not very useful for studying science because it's not quantitative. But if the quantitative thing is things like four, then it's okay because he's already showing you how to count. So you see that four makes you think there's something special about four. You know, um, I don't usually wear a jacket or shoes even, but you know, shoes, I like to point out. Shoes come in like fixed sizes, jackets. Jackets like it goes from like 36 to 38 to 34. So what do you, what do, you do if you're a 35? You, you squeeze, you know, or you squeeze or it's a little too big or maybe you get a bespoke jacket and you don't have to have those sizes. But the thing is you can't go continuously from a size 34 to a size 36, right? I mean you can, you just eat more, eat less, but you can't do it at the, at the clothing store. They don't give you a 34 and a quarter. So the thing about this number four is there's no way to smoothly take the liquid crystal and distort it and change that four to three. What do you got? Four, 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 four. You can't have 3.9 things coming out of this point. It has to go to three, and then that's not continuous, and it's not smooth, right? And all the things that Bob told you about moving the string around and saying the space is the same remains the same. So what are you looking at? Well, you are looking at liquid crystals, oh my gosh, okay, <laughs> liquid crystals, this is terrifying, okay, you look at liquid crystals between polarizers, polarizers, you know, you can go to CVS and buy a polarizer, 
So there's a polarizer that's not very interesting, right? It's like sunglasses. But here, is a, I need a spacer. Okay. Here's another one. And see, not so interesting. Right? But watch, if I rotate this polarizer, it goes black. See, the polarizer lets light through in only one direction or in one plane. So this light's coming through in, say, I don't know, this plane, and this is only letting light through in a different direction. When they're going in the same direction, you get light. When they're the opposite, not, you don't get light. I have little polarizers here, small ones, and I can show you here, see? There you go. And as I rotate it, it goes to black, right? Why is it going to black? It must mean that whatever direction's going through this one is not the direction coming through the one on bottom, right? But this one here, it must be pointing the same way, right? One's up. Okay, so what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen when I put my cross polarizer down? I get nothing, right? Nothing interesting. Because one of them is sending light this way, and one of them is sending light this way, but the cross polarizers mess up both. But if I go in and turn it, then you can see through it, right? The polarizers, the middle polarizer, the one in between, can change the orientation. Who cares? It turns out liquid crystals are polarizers. That's why they're good for optical displays. So, going back to this, I lost the pointer. Okay, sorry. Uh, <coughs> here's the display. This is a display that everybody sees. All right, you have a light bulb in back, you have a backlight. Now it's no longer cool to have a fluorescent one, it's LED or something like that. You have this first thing, the polarizer. The second polarizer is called the analyzer, right? And they're at perpendicular to each other, just like I showed you. You have two polarizers like this, no light goes through. But the liquid crystal molecules, they're like polarizers. They are polarizers. They're in between. And if they lie, say, at 45 degrees or some funny angle like this, then light gets through. Hey, isn't that cool? This picture here, Wherever you see black, it's black because the molecules are along either the polarizer or the analyzer. And when it's bright, it's not. So when the molecules are pointing north, south, east, or west, you don't see anything. I think topologists call that a pre-image, is that right? I, other people can call it a pre-image also, okay? So <coughs> you try to use it at dinner, all right? Try to use it in a conversation. Oop. So here's the picture. I have a, just a little aside for you, right? If you had been around uh, 50 years ago and you had realized that if you could get, not a little hand, but maybe, mm, I don't know, an electric field to rotate that molecule in between, you can make a pixel, right? That's it. That's how a display works, right? Displays are two cross polarizers. There's molecules in between that you can rotate. And you switch the direction of the molecules and you go from black to white. That's it. That's all there is, all right? It was, the, you know, invented, invented right here. I don't know which way is which. Where's RCA? There, it was invented over there, okay? By RCA, at RCA, okay? So there you go, you have a display and you're all set. So let's go back to the picture, right? Why do I see four? I see four because these molecules or these <coughs> little rectangles, oh, I can use this chopstick, right? Like so, the chopstick, when it goes all the way around the center point, it comes back to the way it's pointing. And if you walk around in a circle, you will always see north, south, east, and west by the time you get back and end up pointing the same way you were. Dogs can do this, all right? They do it all the time. They go around trees, right? And it doesn't matter how I go around the circle. All that matters is I go around once. And so I go around once, and I follow these arrows, like so, here's the direction of the molecule. If I have a polarizer and an analyzer, two polarizers, where do I see black? Oh, sorry. Okay, I see black. Oops. Oh, I have to press this button. I see black when the molecules are pointing up and down. When they're pointing down, they're pointing south, black, brush. Or when they're pointing uh, east. Or when they're pointing west. Or when they're pointing north. Okay? You see, they went around once. Why do I get four brushes? Because they have to point north, south, east, and west. Not in that order. North, east, west, I don't know, north, east, north, east, south, and west. Or they can go around the other way. 
four brushes because there are four directions on the compass. And the arrows point in all four directions. And you say, okay, I don't need this now. <coughs> so what? Let's go back to the data. Here's the data. And it was great because I could count the number four over and over again. But now I find out there's another number. There's two. Uh-oh. Sometimes there are two brushes. How do I do two? How do I get back to the way I started if I only look north and east? I mean, there's that puzzle. The answer is the bear is white. You can ask me later. Okay, but the bear is white. It's not that. What's going on? Well, look. Imagine I start making my molecules wrap around. They're like following the New York Times. Okay, the New York Times folded over. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, parade section or the magazine section in between. And you go around. What would you see under cross polarizers, a polarizer and an analyzer? Well, you would see a brush here where the molecules are pointing, I don't know, south. And you'd see another brush where the molecules are there and they're pointing, uh, I don't know which way they're pointing. Maybe they're pointing east. Okay, or maybe, yeah, they're pointing west. See, they're pointing west. And you say, okay, problem solved. That's it. That's how the molecules look. And then you say, uh oh, that's not what topology tells me because those molecules have arrows. A dog can't do this, right? A push me pull you, remember from Dr. Dulu, it can do this, but a dog can't. And so, let's, what do I mean by that? Well, look at this arrow here. Well, let's start trying to fill in all the arrows. Okay, and I get back here and I started here and the arrows point the other way. Which way does the dog point in the middle? It has to point somewhere it had to be pointing to the left and somewhere else it's pointing to the right. What does it do in between? <coughs> and you say, I don't know. How do you solve this? And you say, I know the answer, right? The answer is make them so that the molecules can point both ways. In other words, make molecules that have that left and right are the same, that can be turned around. Chopsticks don't work, but other utensils might. Tongue depressors. They can be tongue depressors. You could turn them around. And you say, is that a prediction? Yes, that's a prediction. When you see two brushes, it means that the molecules must not know the difference between their head and their tail. And then you check, and you say, oh, look, here's a molecule that makes electric crystal. This is what the molecules, this is how chemists draw molecules. They draw these lines, all right? They're much smaller than this and you have these rings, but if you look at it really carefully, you'll notice that's exactly the same as its mirror image. It doesn't know whether it's pointing left to right or right to left. So that's a prediction. Let me remind you what I showed you. I looked at a picture that was maybe a 10,000th of a meter big. I am telling you something about molecules that are a billionth of a meter big. Okay, and I'm doing that without seeing the molecules. No x-rays. No accelerators, nothing. I'm seeing them just by counting the number two. And I know something about the molecules. If I counted the number three, I would know they must be like triangles. All right, if I count the number five, they must be like pentagons. So the counting tells you something about the molecule. These defects, these places where the things come together, are what prevents you from having an inexpensive 120 inch screen. It used to be what prevented you from having an inexpensive 30-inch screen because you would get defects, and the defects would spoil the display. And you'd have to work hard to get rid of them. So what we study is how to explain these very complicated pictures just by counting. And what can we do? And we can count brushes here, and we can count things here. This is a little sexier. These are uh, those ellipses. All right, you can count the number of ellipses, and you can count brushes everywhere. So understanding liquid crystals is important to make displays, but it's also a way that you can use topology. In fact, you're forced to. This is far too complicated to do anything else with. So thank you. So uh, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I just want to ask a few questions, and then I think we will nice to involve uh, the audience. Perhaps I'll start with you, Bob, uh, because clearly you, know, you have a certain kind of vision uh, about the applications of topology. So could you, I mean, what would be kind of a grand dream of to achieve? Well, 
Um, to me, the, the, the statistical properties of very complicated spaces are, are, um, are, are extremely interesting. You, you, you have a space whose many numbers are Avogadro's number, 10 to the 24th. And uh, to analyze such a thing is, 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 is a completely different thing um, mathematically from, from the sorts of spaces that I was showing. And, and so my hope is that there's new interesting mathematics there for us. I was actually wondering because you started by pointing out that topology, on the one hand, it's kind of almost the most kind of basic kind of mathematical <laughs> structure. It's perhaps, in some sense, you could argue even the simplest one. Yes. And yet it was kind of found last in terms of all the great topics in mathematics. And so Galileo had this wonderful picture of, you know, mathematics being the language of nature. Uh, why, why didn't these simple concepts of topology, why do they took so many millennia to be found? Well, geometry or calculus or algebra were discovered so much earlier. Good question. I, I think if you ask the Greeks, is there a ge geometry that doesn't involve distance and volume and area and so on, they would have said there's nothing left when you get rid of those. That's the whole story. Um, I, I don't know. They had no rubber uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing I was fascinated with your discussion is that, and I think, again, this is pointing to this, to this fundamental idea that, you know, there are geometries out there uh, which are not the ones that we can take in our hands, mm -hmm. but they are encoding the genetic structure of life or other complex systems. Um, from your point of view, um, uh, again, could you say that topology might be kind of the natural language to describe some of these structures in the life sciences? Or yeah, uh, well, I don't know if it's the natural language. One of the things that is true, and it's, it's happening in biology, I mean, and now it's, uh, it's kind of pervasive, is that we have a lot of information, and we don't know how to structure this information. So uh, in some cases, like the cases that I was showing, if there is an underlying model like a tree or another thing that you can uh, try to envision, then I think topology can help us to uh, elucidate these things. We don't know if for all the biological data that we have, but there is such a structure, so that I, we don't know. Again, I mean, I think for the tree, we have a long history, and there are a lot of many ways of thinking about these particular problems. Going beyond the tree, we don't have a good way of thinking about that. I don't know if topology is going to be the final answer. I don't know. But I think probably can help us to uh, start thinking about this problem in, in a more abstract way that I think is what we need at the moment. As, as Bob just said, you know, you will have structures where um, the number of loops is 10 to the 24 yes, instead exactly. of 1, so 2, 3. So is that still the right kind of language to use? Or do you think that there will be another kind of branch of topology that is able to deal with these large numbers? So, so that's probably, I'm not the, probably the right person to ask. I mean, probably Bob has been thinking longer in, in these things. But it's true, I mean, in the, sh the examples that I was showing with, uh, with flu, for example, that is a very simple, it's a very simple organism. One of the simplest viruses that you can do that you can find this phenomenon. Typically, with a thousand genomes, you start getting thousands of loops. Uh, now, currently, I mean, uh, they are probably 10 to the 5 uh, viruses that have been sequenced. And now they are coming from uh, all around the world. I mean, this is happening every day now. And then the numbers are very, very large. I mean, now we are getting to the computational limits that we have to compute these numbers. And now the idea is what Bob was mentioning. I mean, we can start doing statistics on these things. And they are revealing... I was showing some particular two distributions, small loops and large loops, and reveal different things. That's very interesting. I think there are a lot of structure there that doing statistics in large petty numbers can help us to, to elucidate that. One thing I'm particularly interested for your point of view, Randy, that you know, the kind of examples you gave are actually physical. This is a liquid crystal. It's truly two-dimensional. It's the thing that you see. Mm -hmm. It's the structures you see. The examples that uh, Raoul was describing were more kind of in some kind of abstract space. Of, uh, so, can you say something about you know, how kind of the more physical appearances of topology, how they are related to these studying large data sets, etc.? Is, is there well, some? Well, I mean, so <coughs> you know, all of us have our shoes nicely tied right now in knots, yes. and um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was fashionable a hundred years ago. I think they're all unknots because we can untie them. <laughs> <laughs> Although they they actually hold your shoes on pretty well. Yes. So. Um, and that's an interesting point. You can untie them, but still they're somehow knots. Yes. So there's this question of physical knots right. compared to mathematical knots. Yes. 
But, you know, 100 years ago, it was fashionable to think that atoms were little knots mm -hmm. stuck in the ether, right? And um, this somehow, the liquid crystal work, is a realization of that. You have these objects which live forever, the crosses and the brushes live forever, and you want to get rid of them mm -hmm. to make something good. And so the technology, technological advances require control of that. In fact, I was going to show a picture, but it was, <coughs> I found it too complicated. A picture where, in fact, you write those crosses and you can actually make something. So instead of having an iPad that constantly needs a battery, you have an iPad that you write once and it stays. And then you can write on it later if you want to. So this is about energy and it's about making a s different kind of modality for well, One thing you didn't mention, but of course, which uh, certainly I think, you know, there's a lot of work also be done at the Institute here, I mean, Edward Witten and others, you know, uh, using kind of these topological methods uh, to, as you said, you know, it's kind of reducing something to something very simple, but it's not really nothing. There's still something there that actually is, you know, might be very relevant to building quantum computers, et cetera. Is, th is that something that, you know, Absolutely, uh, or is in the same sphere? People have talked about using the tangled up bits of liquid crystal to make, um, what's that thing, memories, mm -hmm. right? Permanent memories, which are very robust and can't be destroyed. Mm. The other thing that's nice about liquid crystals is that you can shake them around a lot, and when you're all done, the material comes back to where it was. And that's true when you talk about quantum computing or other topologically stable objects that live in three dimensions, is that this is a kind of con conserved thing it isn't conserved by the usual laws of physics, the usual way that we talk about conserved laws. You have these conserved objects. They become the players. You can ignore everything else. Mm -hmm. I, another question, I think, for all three of you, and I would like to turn to the audience, is uh, in the other great examples where mathematics was interacting with the natural world, uh, whether it's through calculus or others, I mean, the natural phenomena had a great impact on our mathematical thinking. Uh, Topology started kind of in an abstract way, uh, but are there examples, you know, I would like all three of you to reflect where perhaps uh, the contact with real world phenomena is changing the way topology is evolving as a, as a mathematical field? I think Raul's example is a very good one. This persistent homology was, um, maybe it was there in principle, but, but all the theory of it has been developed because of the applications. And are these applications now also in pure math too, or are they just I going in one direction? I, th I think they w will be. I want to look at large eigenvalues on a Riemann surface. I'm, that's a very topologically complicated thing. I'm sure these techniques are the right way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, I can tell you, for example, some of the, of the I mean, of the, with the data that we are working, I mean, as I was mentioning at the end, very briefly, we are working with some mathematicians because, I mean, in the current, at least, all this framework that they were sh uh, showing, these persons in homology, is very recent. So there are many questions about, for example, the statistics. I mean, uh, there are a few papers and many people working on how to do statistics with large petty numbers. But uh, in, in biology, we're very interested in some particular statistics. I mean, it's not just some random thing. And I don't think this, this is coming from just pure math. I think basically the applications that we have can help some of the, bi some of the mathematicians to look at what is the, uh, the problem. So you, you think certain new mathematical concepts could emerge from? But that, I, yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert, so I cannot, yeah. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot mention. But there are certainly things that we need from, from, from the mathematics that they are not there. I mean, we are working on many different things. For example, I was mentioning only just one dimensional loops. In the moment that you go to higher dimensional loops, if you have higher Betty numbers, that the ones that we are describing also with Bob, their interpretation is, I mean, we get a lot of these structures. Uh, we don't understand the biology of that. I mean, there's very interesting uh, structures there. We don't understand the biology, but I mean, um, there is a huge need also for trying to understand what is the correspondence between the two sides. And, um, and yeah, we are doing some conjectures from the biological side because we see a lot of organisms, we do a lot of simulations, the computer is helping us a lot in these things, and then we observe some phenomena, see some distributions, but we don't understand from the topological side, I mean, why they appear, I mean, we don't understand that. So, um, yeah, we are working with uh, some of the of Carlton and other people. Randy, uh, from well, your point of view, is, is... Well, so I guess, so all these things, looking at four crosses and knowing that <coughs> they're there, and people have talked about these kind of defects in other systems, it was all brought together in one one fell swoop in the 70s that people understood that you could understand all of this using algebraic topology. Yes. Um, 
But it turns out that there are systems that they were even recognized in the 70s where the standard homotopy theory, which Bob didn't talk about, but it's also about counting, uh, fail, and you can't use them. And so one of the great things I visited here in 2009, I get to talk to Bob you know, once a month because of these workshops, is uh, I get to ask him, well, how do you do this? Most of the time, most of the time it takes a few hours to get the question across, mm -hmm. but I, I suspect that there's at least undiscovered or math that is inaccessible to the scientists uh, yet to be explained or discovered that will allow us to study those more complex systems. Thank you. Just looking around in the audience, if anybody you question to any of, any of the three speakers. Just wait for a moment for a, a So this is more aimed at everybody, but this is sort of to elaborate on something I already asked, but you had mentioned different mathematical structures. During the talk, kind of the, the main focus was on homology, on, on Betty numbers, but I was curious about for applications to the real world. In topology, we have all these other things like K-theory, cobordism theory, if any of those. I mean, it would have to be something that you could actually compute to apply it to some real world system. And so, you know, homotopy probably might not work that well, but has there been any attempts at trying to use other invariants applied to nature? Well, the liquid crystal case, we are using homotopy theory and like all homotopy groups, or yeah, and 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 the and the question of dynamics and how those materials evolve really is a question of bordism theory. Mm -hmm. um, how to apply those is one of the reasons that I get to talk to Bob wow. once a month. Just a split second. Uh, I remember uh, the first person that told me topology it was point set topology. Mind you, told me, don't think of it as a language about spaces. Think of it as a language about sets, which is actually extremely useful at the time because I stopped worrying about what it means spatially and just went about thinking of them as just sets. And I, I, I did quite well. So I'm wondering, what do you think is it that is, explains this applicability? Is it the fact that the language is sufficiently general, that it can be applied to things that cannot immediately be seen as spatial? Or is it spatial intuition that is actually guiding the application? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I should comment that doing homology in the context of point set topo topology took uh, about 80 years from the time it was first defined to the time that was achieved. Thank you. I mean, I'm also looking at the, uh, on, on the clock, I think, you know, I think a terrific job. I must say, just, I hope that all of you now look different at the scissor or a drill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, you, uh, I think you, one thing about kind of exciting, if you think of the number of topics that you covered in this uh, 45 minutes, it's just pretty amazing. I think it's a, it's a wonderful reflection of what's happening here at the Institute. And uh, I hope you all join me in thanking our three speakers.